Hiya. Uh, yeah, I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so I'll try and be brief. Um, welcome, everyone. So today, or this talk is going to be about XDK Live, a name which we're going to talk about as well, which is a new programming language for the embedded IoT. Right? And when I say embedded, what I mean with that is sort of Cortex M3, M4 class. Right? We're not talking about embedded Linux, or anything like that. We're more talking about something that is a real-time operating system, such as FreeRTOS or the likes. So we're going to start off with a demo, um, just so you know what, what it is I'm going to present. And we're going to use, be using this little device here, which I'm holding up, which is um, the Bosch XDK cross-domain development kit. has pretty much all the sensors in that, that Bosch makes, like a accelerometer, gyroscope, temperature, humidity, pressure, light. Uh, has a microphone, buttons, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, battery, everything you need to build IoT from a device perspective. Um, and so we want to use this device and uh, build a simple shock detector that detects using the accelerometer if a shock happened, and if it did, um, sends out a message via Bluetooth, and maybe we want to use the LEDs as well because you know we want to get some feedback on the device directly. And so this is, is the workbench or the IDE that we ship um, with, with the product, which is obviously Eclipse-based. Um, and so to, to start off the language, um, it's an event-based language, the 60K Live. Um, you can see all the events that were available on the system. Time is an event as well. So you can do things like every 100 milliseconds do something. For example, you can read the accelerometer and see if the acceleration uh, exceeds a certain threshold. And notice how I'm directly using uh, the sensor value. didn't have to set up anything. Now, I want to set up um, LEDs because I want to show it to the user when a shock happens. And so I'm just going to use my LED and create a signal, which I can name by my own choosing. I name it shock detected. And this signal shall light up an LED, preferably the red one. Right. I might also want to show when the system is running, so I just create myself another system running. And on the startup event, yet another event, um, I set that to true. And th setting this to true lights up the LED, setting it to false, turns it off. Now, the cool thing is I can do the very same thing for Bluetooth, right? If I want to do Bluetooth, all I do is I set up my Bluetooth using setup. And I create myself another s uh, signal, which I call shock detected again, because you know it's the same thing. And Bluetooth has those characteristics. I know it's familiar with GAT characteristics, um, which in this case is Boolean. And again, I just use this as a variable. And we're going to see in a moment what code comes out of this, uh, what is needed to, to make this work. I also want to be able to reset it when I press the button. So when I press button 1, again, just yet another event. So on saving, it uh, created a bunch of code, uh, a lot of C code, which we can inspect. So this transpiles to C little detail here. And this is the code that, that implemented that. We're going to, you know, it's very brief here. We're going to go into detail on all of this, no worries. Um, but just to show that it's working, the device has been flashed right now. Or, yeah, stop flashing right now. And we see our device, BLE smartphone. I didn't give a name, so it just came up with one. Um, and we listen for the notifications. And when I shake the device, you see the notifications come in. And when I press the button, it's reset. So, and that just now took us, what, 15 lines of code, and, well, it was a bit sped up, I have to admit, but uh, about three minutes, right, um, to build that on, on a fairly complex device. So, the brief message here, if you, um, if you take anything away from, from what you've just seen, is that what XDK Live does is it makes developing for a actually quite complex system quite simple. Well, doesn't every programming language promise that? Now, let's take a quick step back, um, see where we're coming from, and then we're going to introduce um, what, what XDK Life is about and go into detail on all the things that you've just seen, right? So this was very brief. We're going to go into detail on that. Let's start with, take a step back and start thinking about IoT and, and the embedded IoT. And when we think about IoT, we always hear those massively crazy numbers, right? 50 billion devices in tomorrow. Um, but what we see really when, when as practitioners, when, when we try and do IoT, we see there is, there is a lot of scale here at work, right? So we typically start off with this sort of prototyping phase, POC phase, where we build up one to ten devices on a breadboard or sticking together some dev kit or something like that. 
Then at some point, might want to deploy that on a larger scale. We start um, building our own PCBA, go to design for manufacturing. And at all of those steps, there is sort of an increase of accumulated effort, right? So if you, if you look at the effort that you need to, uh, to get to those quantities, you always have these steps in there. Um, what's interesting here is the XCK, shameless plug, uh, makes that a bit easier, right? It, it takes those steps of effort away. We're going to see why in a minute. Another very interesting observation is that um, recent studies have found that 90% of all IoT projects right now have 500 devices or less. Right, let that sink in for a minute. For one, it means if we want to get to those billion quantities, we're still a bit, still a bit out. But it also means that most of the time developing your own hardware isn't the effort in your IoT project, it's the software. Surprise. So, why is the XCK interesting? Um, and, and where are we going to go with, with, with all this um, IoT stuff right now? Um, well, the XCK has pretty much all the sensors in there that, that you would need to um, develop or try out your, your prototype, which is what makes it really interesting, right? So you don't have to stick together a bunch of sensors with wires and um, try and 3D print a case around and ship that to some customer. But uh, you take that box that looks neat, is certified, and that, that you can ship out, even in serious deployment, right? So as long as you need, um, I as long as you're below that threshold where it's worth building your own hardware, um, you might as well ship hardware that someone else built um, that, that you know works. But what that also means is that this system and many other IoT systems are really, really complex, right? Um, so what we, what we really need is a way to program those systems um, which feel good. That's a very soft topic. That's a very soft target, right? But many, like IoT is really bridging two worlds here. On one hand, we have the cloud, let's call them cloud people, right? TypeScript, JavaScript, that's your home. That's, that's where you feel comfortable. And on the other hand, you have sort of the, the embedded side that comes in there where the language is more something like C, right? Maybe C++. Um, and both have to meet somewhere um, where, where both are in their comfort zone, where it feels good for both of them. Um, convenience matters a lot, particularly if you want to do a POC, you want to be quick, right? You want to prove your concept um, fast so you can fail fast and try again should the need be. Um, and with any programming language, if you're a power user, if, if you know what you're doing, if you've been doing embedded stuff for, for a decade, you do not want to be annoyed by this new programming language that's going to make the world better. Right? You don't want to be hitting that glass ceiling at some point. Now, what we also want, though, and that's why the scale across quantity was important, we want to scale to production as well. Once you've done your POC, you don't want to start from scratch again. You don't want to have to throw it all away, all that manpower that you've just put in, and because now you're going into product, right? That's a different world. No, you want the seamless transition um, from, from one to 10 devices to 1,000 devices. Right? And if you're gonna, there's also drastically different requirements. If you're gonna put something, if you're gonna put 10 devices into the field, your requirements, the control that you need over these devices is, not nearly as much if you're going to put a thousand of those in the field. Right. Um, so that means that you need a lot of a lot of trust in in your software. You need to build it based on proven infrastructure, things that uh, that have been shown to work in practice. And lastly, um, because we're talking about this really low power hardware, right? We're talking about um, runtime up to three to four years um, at times. So that also really restricts what we can do on those devices, right? It really restricts the overhead that we can incur for memory management. Garbage collection is, is out of the question, for example. Right, so you may be thinking, well, there are a lot of um, sort of neat languages that, uh, that would help us sort of meet in the middle, you know, that would cover this middle ground between flexibility and control. Um, and indeed, a lot have been proposed on the embedded side of things, like Lua is the obvious thing that, that you would come to think of. Um, or there's MRuby, developed by Mats himself, a Japanese research project. Um, but very quickly, what we find with those is, A, they're very expensive at runtime, um, and they remove you yet another layer from your system, right? So you're going to be wrapping all the, the hardware control and an yet another set of APIs, and good luck debugging that if your timing on your I2C bus is wrong, right? So when it comes to the nitty-gritty 
embedded side of things, um, with these sort of really high level abstractions on top, you're gonna have a hard time um, getting this to work. <coughs> we could also be thinking about something like rust. Um, unfortunately, rust on bare metal is still a few years out, right? So when we look at projects like Sync, uh, or for Swift, there's one called Taylor, as in Taylor Swift. Um, we're, still, we're still a few good years away before we're gonna use that in production. Um, C++ is something we better talk about over beer. I mean, there's a lot of philosoph philosophical questions that go in there. And then when you, when you think about the developer experience, um, there are other platforms out there that are perceived as really, really easy and straightforward to use. Arduino is the first one that comes to mind, right? Who, who has heard of Arduino? Show of hands, please. See, so it, it's a fairly common, fairly well-known platform which promises this easy, easy um, way in, but the moment you want to do something more advanced, you very quickly hit this glass ceiling. Right. So when thinking about where to go from here, how to sort of solve this, what's essentially a developer experience issue, um, and we look at research, there, for example, we find stuff like um, the .NET Gadgeteer work that was done by Microsoft Research a few years back, and what they've built is they've built an IoT prototyping kit, and their Hello World was a Wi-Fi enabled digital camera, right? That was their Hello World. So it's a really, really powerful kit, uh, and what makes it so powerful is the IDE. Well, I don't have to, I'm preaching to the choir here when I'm saying that a powerful IDE is important. At the same time, what we found in, in practice is that to a lot of people, sensor data is actually something fairly abstract. Right. We all think, okay, I, I have an intuitive grasp of what, uh, what a gyroscope does or what an accelerometer does or how my temperature data behaves. But in reality, when you deploy that or try to put that on a machine or uh, put that into some environment, it's quite difficult to get an understanding of how your data is actually going to behave. And you know, how, what sampling rate do I need? Um, what range do I need to configure my sensor? And all those kind of things are, are not exactly intuitive. Um, and so if you can directly observe how your sensor behaves, if you can sort of directly interact with your sensors, um, that helps a lot. And lastly, um, we always, or we quite often think about programming languages and DSLs as something more or less separate, right? So you, you have this sort of declarative, model-driven side of things where you describe your world, and then you have sort of this imperative side of things where uh, you might use an API to do the same thing, but really you're describing behavior more than anything else. And so also there, you know, we, we've seen that um, also used in practice, um, combining it, thinking of a programming language as a domain-specific language. And so with, with those three things in mind, um, what we set out to do here is to build a language which transpiles to C. So XDK Live, as you've seen just before, transpiles to C, which has a few benefits, quite a few. One, you can inspect the code that it generates. You can, you can learn from it, you can, see, you can uh, see if you trust it, if it does the right thing. You can use all the brilliant tools that are out there for, for C development. Um, all your debugging infrastructure all of a sudden works again. Um, and at some point, should you hit a ceiling with XDK Live, things that you cannot do in this language just because it doesn't support it yet, or maybe never will, um, you can always fall back to the C world and carry on there. If you do your POC in, in XDK Live and then think, well, I want to go towards a product, you can use the C code that came out of here as a starting point and you're not starting from scratch again. Right? So you can, you can really leverage that manpower that you've, that you've invested before. So what is this, this XDK Live? What is this programming language that we're talking about? Uh, for one, it's an, it's an imperative language, right? So, um, we might think about functional elements at the fu uh, in the future, stuff like folding over, um, over iterables and stuff like that, all the neat things that, that you've come to expect in, in, other in the other, like sort of higher levels, like the JavaScript world, for example. Uh, it is event-driven, as you've seen, um, so we can, which really maps nicely to the IoT world, where quite often we want to react to sensor events, like my device was dropped, or something passed over the light sensor, or temperature went above a certain threshold. Um, it supports exceptions. If you're in the pure C world, um, you know, you'd have weird red codes that you need to interpret. It takes all that away from you. 
Um, it has a thing called extension methods. We're going to see an example of that, which gives you a sort of object-oriented feeling, even though it's not an object-oriented language. Um, and it has neat things like string interpolation. Again, something if you're in a pure C world, um, this will make your life more comfortable. Uh, the type system behind it is uh, it's a statically typed language at compile time. Um, it does support type inference to a certain extent. Uh, sometimes you have to help it along, but as it is with all those languages, it has generics, so you no longer just have an array, but you have, a, um, you have an array of int or an array of a structure, something like that. And it has a um, static, heapless memory management. No ML lock, no free in your code. Right, it's all on the heap. Then comes in the, the DSL side of things. Uh, it's model driven. So if you want to set up the resources on your device, such as your BLE radio or your temperature sensor or anything like that, um, you, set that you set that up. Uh, you configure it before the program even runs, and then there's C code generated that actually executes it on the platform. You have direct access to your um, to your sensors. You know you don't need to uh, initialize and enable and configure your sensors. You can just use your sensor data as if it were a variable, as if it were just present in the environment. You have. Um, all of this is powered by an underlying platform description. So this is by no means specific to the XDK. I'll re-emphasize that. So all this uh, language, even though it at the moment carries XDK in the name, it is not XDK specific. If you have your own IoT platform and you think you want uh, to enable your users to, to build software for your platform using, uh, using this uh, tool, you're more than welcome to. Right? So you can integrate your own platform on that. And as I've mentioned a few times now, it transpiles to C code, right? So um, you, get, you get C code out in the end. Uh, you have traceability between the C code that's generated and the XDK live code, thanks to the latest or almost latest XTEX release, not quite latest. Um, and also, we've taken great care to carry over things like variable names, comments, function names. They carry over into the generated C code just to make that link between the two worlds easier. Now, let's look at a few examples, shall we? How does this look like? For one, it's an imperative language, right? So if you look at that and you've seen anything like TypeScript, for example, this will not look outlandish to you. A lot of that um, will look familiar. To boot, you have all the classic control structures that you'd expect, um, if, for, do, while, et cetera, not even worth mentioning. Oops. Um, you have mutable and immutable variables or constants. Um, and you have static typing with generics, right? So for example, here we have a function that takes an iterable of t um, and, and returns a t, right? So classical generics. Then we have extension methods. Um, so if we have that function that computes the mean of, of a list, we can just call it as you would call a function in any other language, or you can write the first argument of the function on the left side. Anyone here who's familiar with extend, you know, you know this feature, right? Extend is even, <laughs> is even um, I mean, it's probably even named because of that, like that, right? So um, we sort of nicked that feature and put it in as well because it's really, really neat. Um, and the standard library is implemented like that, right? So the uh, length on, on an iterable, for example, is, uh, is, is a function that is just an extension method to, um, to that type. Right, so that, that's on the, on the imperative side of things. On the declarative side of things, where you set up your, um, your system, where you configure um, basically the hardware that your program is going to run on, um, we have a somewhat simple underlying model. And this is a grossly simplified view on that, right? Obviously, the real world looks a bit more difficult. But in essence, what we did is we described platforms. The XDK 110 is such a platform, but there may be others, right? So again, if you have your own IoT hardware uh, or soft, uh, like IoT platform that you want to um, use, you can. And these platforms describe their sensors, their GPIO interfaces to the rest of the world, stuff like I2C, ESPI, you name it, um, and the, the connectivity that they have available. All those system resources 
um, have two things in common. One, they can describe so-called configuration items. So on a sensor, it's something like the range that it can measure. On BLE, it may be the advertising interval, um, something like that. So basically attributes of, of those system resources. And all of those can offer events, right? So um, a GPIO pin can offer a rising or falling interrupt event, something like that. Now, if a user, and a user is in this case the developer of that program, wants to set up any of the system resources, it's always done with a setup keyword. You write setup, name of the resource, and off you go. And then you get offered all the configuration items that were previously defined in, in the platform. And what's really key here is that for all of those things, you get really nice IDE support. Right, so and this is what makes, what makes it easy. You can discover what your platform is capable of doing as you write your program. You don't have to read a load of API documentation before you get going just to find out how you're going to use that accelerometer. Uh, but you hit control space and you realize there's an accelerometer available and you use it. Right? You don't have to care much how. Um, you can, you can name certain things, uh, GPO or also connectivity can be named. So here, for example, I'm configuring a, a, a Wi-Fi, which is maybe my DEF network. Um, and then I'm reusing that uh, when I configure my lightweight M2M connectivity. Right? So I'm, uh, I'm con connecting to some lightweight M2M service, and I'm doing that over Wi-Fi, and uh, so I just reference my Wi-Fi configuration. Now, what you see down here is, again, shock detected. Um, no wrong conclusion, you can name things other than shock detected. It's just a really convenient example. Um, and what we see here is that we're configuring a lightweight M2M property, um, which we can later access using this name that we've just given it. And these sort of configurable things down here is what we've somewhat uh, inconveniently called variable configuration items. And we're going to see examples of those. But basically what they do is they look like a function call, but in reality are, um, are a declarative element. So we get an EMF model out of this that we can generate code from. Right? So we can do a lot more than just calling a function. Um, we can have a lot more initialization in there, etc. We're going to see more examples of those variable configuration items, and I hope they'll make clear what they are. Here's another one, for example, um, if we want to set up our GPIO, right? So here we're configuring a, our pin A4, whatever that is, right? That obviously depends on the platform. Um, and we're giving that a digital out. If you've ever worked with an Arduino, this is going to look familiar, right? And what that does is later in your code, you can write things like GPIO.external LED equals true. And then it will go high or equals false, it will go low. So these variable configuration items have types, um, which obviously there's IDE support for, um, and that will help you to use those. What's really neat is um, in a future version, <laughs> this is going to work with I2C as well, for example. So if you want to implement a driver for, for an I2C uh, component that you've connected to, to an extension bus or that is part of your system, um, you can sort of directly copy almost copy-paste the uh, register map from your data sheet into your code, right? So you can sort of set up this register map in here, and then if in your code you read um, mysensor.crec1, in the background, like to you as a developer, it looks like a variable access, but in the background it's going to do the I2C transaction, going to ask the sensor and come back with that, right? So all this complexity is hidden away from you. On XDK Live level, on C level, obviously you see it, right? you see it. Um, accelerometers are, or any sensor really, uh, works just the same way. So sensors are defined by the platform and as a developer to you, they just magically exist in your environment. They're part of your global namespace. And you can use them as, uh, as if they were variables. Right? Again, you don't have to set up any sort of resource and initialize your board, none of that. It, it's just there. You can set them up, of course, right? So there are setup blocks. If you want to change the defaults, you can. It's event-driven, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we're going to see the, the kinds of events that we have available. But what's worth noting is that um, when it comes to concurrency, we sort of took the easy way out and just added a, an event loop. So whenever an event happens, it gets stuffed in that event loop which is just executed one after the other, which also means that if you have an event handler that has a while true in there, your system's going to block. 
it has so it has the disadvantage that you don't get any hard real time um, guarantees anymore, but it has the massive massive advantage that it uh, really simplifies the programming model. As an outlook, we are working on concepts of getting true concurrency in there. Now, as for the events that are available, um, there are time events. We've seen that, like every five seconds, every 100 milliseconds, stuff like that. There are sensor-defined events, something like um, a sonorometer activity. So for example, all the Bosch sensor tech uh, sensors offer um, all kinds of recognition things, like step detection and fall detection and free fall detection and activity detection and you name it. Right? And all those events are available to you. Um, then there are connectivity events, so if your Wi-Fi connects or disconnects, stuff like that. Um, and then once there is GPO, there's going to be GPO events. Um, so for example, a falling edge on, on a GPO pin, you can react to that as well. Right, so that, that's it for the, for the basic language. Where do we go from there? Um, where are we with all this? Right? So I sort of mix tenses. Right now, a lot of this stuff already exists. Some of this stuff will exist. Um, right today, actually, <laughs> hey, we can announce the, the release of that. So today is the first public release of this stuff. Um, and it is available at xdk.io. The downside is you need an xdk, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you really want to play, I mean, not, not a downside. The xdk is a really cool thing, so you should all have one. But um, <laughs> You'll need an XDK to play with this? No, 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 this is purely objective. Um, if you want to play with those, we're also part of the IoT Playground. Actually, I even had a slide for that. Um, should have said that first, okay. We are part of the IoT Playground today. So we brought a bunch of the XDKs. If you want to play with those, uh, if you want to play with what I just showed, uh, you're more than welcome to um, have a go at it. And we have an Eclipse project proposal in the making. So the idea is to make all of this open source, uh, make that part of the Eclipse world, uh, because we believe that it really nicely complements the Eclipse IoT ecosystem, right? So we have a lot on, on sort of the cloud side of things. We're really going down to the embedded Linux side, but on the, on the really sort of nitty-gritty embedded Artos, uh, we still have a bit of a gap which we're trying to fill here. So as takeaway, XDK Live is a new, pr or yeah, XDK Live is a new programming language for the embedded IoT. Um, it enables very high-level features which are transpiled to C, good old model-driven development at the end of the day. Uh, and it is not limited to the XDK. Right? It carries the name XDK in its name right now. The project proposal proposes a different name. Um, we're also open for ideas on how to call that one. Uh, as you know, it's hard to name a baby. This is no different. And again, if you want to play with this, xdk.io. Thank you very much. I think we have plenty of time for questions, actually. Um, is it possible to invoke um, like sort of CPU or something? Yes. So we have, um, we have a, at the moment, somewhat crude but existing foreign function interface where um, you can register generated functions and you put a generator behind and that then calls whatever C code you want. Um, there is no direct integration with the CDT yet, maybe. All right, so if you, if you just have a header somewhere in your include path, it will not be automatically part of the namespace. No, um, there is traceability between the two. Um, but debugging at the moment is on C level. The C code though, um, so we took great pains to uh, make the C code as readable and as nice as we can, right? Many times with generated code, it's a bit difficult. Um, we really tried to make that as, as yeah, good as we could. Yes, um, in two ways. For one, um, if you're the one defining the platform, obviously you can add as many as you want. Um, and you can add platform extensions, where for example, if, uh, so this particular platform has, has an extension bus, as do many others. And if um, you're a product vendor and you connect to a, um, you connect to one of those platforms that support XK Live, you can write a platform extension which offers new events. 
Right, so if, I don't know, if you're a Sigfox and you want to add a Sigfox extension module um, and that has particular events, you can supply those through a platform extension, which is an Eclipse plugin at the end of the day. Right? Um, so we, um, at the moment, this is sort of the reference platform simply because of where we came from or where we come from. Um, what we will do um, is sort of, in a sort of eat, eat your own dog food kind of thing, um, make sure, like, you know, have a prototypical implementation for other platforms, for example, in Arduino. But it's, it's not meant as a um, here, go and use it thing. It's more meant as a us testing if this concept really works, right? Like works in practice, not just works on in our heads. Um, so there is, at the very basic, you need to create what's you need to create the platform description, which is a DSL of uh, a DSL of its own. It's fairly straightforward, or really straightforward actually, um, which describes what sensors you have and what uh, what components are available. And then for those components, you need to write a generator. So there's there's an API that you need to implement, um, which which generates code um, that then implements the program that. Uh, that will run on the platform. So for example, um, startup behavior, right? So how, what do I need to do <laughs> after my, even to start my real-time operating system, what do I need to do for that? And all those, those kind of things um, are part of that platform generator, for example. So if you wanted to do, for example, for an, if you wanted to do it for an Arduino, I would reckon that for the for the very basics, um, it's an hour or something, All right? So it's that one's really quick. Yes. Yes. You get API support for that, right? But um, you need to do that bit of glue code yourself. Um, we have not implemented it. What you get in the end is, um, so this is all based on Xtext. Um, I didn't mention it because it's fairly obvious that if you want to build something as cool as that, you need to use Xtext. Um, you get an EMF model at the end of the day. So if, uh, if the hardware or the platform that you want to run this on, um, if you can simulate that in a sensible way, you could write a, s a simulator based on, based on that EMF model. Things that um, that we've been playing with, which alludes to that um, direct interaction with sensor values, is stuff, for example, if a user accesses a sensor value, they can right click on it and go inspect, and then a program is generated that uses the sensor in exactly that configuration that the user is using it, flashed on the device, and then you get a live graph of that sensor data. Right, in exactly that configuration, which also means that you can be f somewhat, you can be more certain than if you were to just write your own program, um, that the sensor data that you're seeing here is actually what you're going to see in the real world in your program. There you go. <laughs> Inside is a is a Cortex M3 with a one megabyte of flash. Uh, not sure how much RAM it has, but it's in. Uh, do you know how much RAM it has? 128. 128. There we are. Yeah, yeah Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, battery, um, CE, FCC certi certified for quite a few countries. Which also means you can give that to customers, right? So this was always the key part, the key point that you don't have to go through some dev kit loophole in the radio equipment directive, but you can give this into the hands of people, and legally you're fine. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Please ask the lawyer of whatever company you work for. This is. 
Legally, you're probably fine. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Thank you very much.